one of the key traits of design is um, empathy, right? So if you want to understand the customer's problems, you need to empathize with them and then you need to get to the real deeper insights about what, it, what exactly goes on with them and what exactly is the problem that you kind of need to focus on and, and solve that drives the, the real innovation. So uh, but that's one of the key bits of women. To be honest with you, the team that I'm working with, it's, it, it, there are four researchers, all of them are women. Uh, they bring uh, lots of um, qualities to what they do because uh, they can be patient with, with the people whom they are doing research with, uh, patience and uh, um, um, insightfulness, being able to uh, gather all the data and then consolidate all the data for us and, uh, and designers to work with. And they're also uh, very successful in building uh, long-standing relationship with uh, key stakeholders in the business. So uh, this is the team that I'm working with. They have uh, a great influence across the business. And one uh, such example that you could take is an uh, example of the SVP of the Pacific system uh, where I come from. Her name is Catherine Parade, and then she has established a team of 200 designers in the span of four years, and then she's grown all the way from uh, manager to director to senior VP. Three uh, below in the span of three years. That's a remarkable achievement, which has kind of inspired me to think about why don't we have um, more such success stories in the industry out there. So uh, that forms the uh, team of this panel. I'm going to uh, let the panelists introduce themselves, and uh, as they introduce themselves briefly, I'd like them to share their perspective on what do you think about this topic. Let's start with Sanjay. Okay, thanks. Men first with this panel. <laughs> um, so, hi everyone, I'm Samir Chabukswar. Uh, I'm from Use Designs and the CEO of Use Designs. And uh, I've been uh, working in user experience design for about uh, more than 15, 17 years now. Uh, we formed Use Designs about six years back, and since then we've never looked back. Um, in fact, even today we have about 50% uh, women. <coughs> Um, and 50 percent men in our organizations. Uh, the perspective that I'd like to bring is uh, we were talking yesterday and uh, a lot of people probably feel that women in design as a topic is you know itself introducing gender bias. It's not so. Uh, so my perspective about this topic here is that it's like a celebration. In India um, we celebrate the power of woman, the power of Shakti at Navaratri, which is just next week. And so it's, it's a tradition of celebrating that Shakti, the origin of woman. And I think this great topic kind of brings that out um, just in the context of design. Um, and if you look at the you know nine different avatars, they bring in you know one larger topic is uh, the victory of good over evil. So good design versus bad design. <laughs> I hope. Uh, and then, you know, all of the other avatars kind of represent uh, simplicity, efficiency, uh, purity, knowledge, wealth, uh, in different contexts. And I think all those can be seen in uh, the design field or, or as required in the design field. So I'd like to start with that perspective. Thank you, Samir. Can we go to Deepa? Hi, everyone. My name is Deepa Bachu. Actually, it'd be great if we have the house lights on so we can actually see folks and not get blinded. Please turn on the lights, please. At least in the main area. We could have the house lights on. Um, so my name is Deepa Bachu. I have about 20 years of experience working mostly for multinationals and one startup. Um, I do everything that um, goes into building a product. I started off as an engineer, um, learned to be a designer on the job, and then did product management and strategy. So I like to think of myself as a creator. About two months ago, I took a plunge from corporate and started my own company with a friend. Um, it's called Pensar. Don't try Googling us, we don't even have a website just out yet. 
Um, it's, uh, the idea is really to foster design leadership. Um, as a designer, I, I believe a big part of my job is to evangelize design. And I wish that there were more people that were sensitive to design. So what I'm trying to do is really create um, a company that can then foster design thinkers and design leaders uh, by co-creating. Uh, co-creating is a concept that we all as designers understand, but in the industry it's yeah. very less understood. How do you really reimagine product experiences? How do you create that unexpected delight and that emotion with the customer that people can't imagine going back to their old way of doing things? Um, I definitely have a technology bias, but experiences are just generally, um, you know, what you experience. It's very, very general. Um, so I hope to uh, talk, chat with you today about my perspective about women. Um, I work in an industry, a software industry, that's mostly men. At best, there's 70% men and 30% women. And as you make more and more career progression, you start that ratio starts to thin down. Um, you know, a lot of meetings, I find that I'm the only woman in the room. And for the most part, I don't even notice it anymore. And I would step back and think, gosh, you know, I love my job, I love the people that work with me. Is there really a problem? But I now know that there is. It's important to have um, a diverse set of team working with you, because why? Diversity allows innovative ideas. Diversity allows them that unexpected to life. And I personally very respectfully disagree. I don't think women are better with empathy than men. It's just that we bring in that sense of diversity. And diversity is really, really important and essential ingredient for disruptive innovation. If you wanted to do incremental innovation, it's fine. You can have everyone in the same cookie cutter mode. But if you want to really come up with disruptive experiences, if you want to come up with an unexpected delight, um, then you really need a diverse set of people. And gender diversity is an obvious um, place that you can start. Um, I think India, we have such huge cultural diversity just within our country. And it's wonderful that a place like Bangalore just automatically um, you know, attracts people from different cultures and backgrounds. And I think we need to celebrate that and allow that to happen versus say, you know, this is not good or that's not good. So I think gender diversity is really important. I, for one, would love to see more women in the room where I'm at, um, so my voice doesn't get, uh, you know, um, uh, suppressed. I'm looking for. Yeah. Suppressed. Suppressed. Thank you. I would like to suppress. Um, but I'd love to sort of chat more, and it's great to see a diverse group here. Um, although I'm a woman and I do speak about in women forums, um, it's great to see that there's a diverse crowd here and not just women, so that's a great place to start. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Deepa. So, uh, hi, uh, I'm Gaina Williams and I'm from uh, Seattle, Washington. And my background is, um, I come from uh, a user experience background with uh, mostly focused in research. Um, so my career started at Microsoft where I spent most of my time growing user experience. And the cool part was when I joined the company, what was design and usability was just a very, very small part of the product experience. And so I spent a lot of my career just pushing the agenda of user experience. And I think anyone that actually started in user experience that long ago has the same experiences. Like, we were the minority discipline among so many engineers. It's still pretty much the case, though, as we've been talking about and celebrating here, it's like design has really stepped up and the demand went up because consumers expect it and it's profitability that they get interested in. And so for most of my career, I was really focused on not, it wasn't being just the only woman in the room, it was being the only person with a customer perspective in the room. And so I really learned to push the agenda. And it wasn't until a lot later in my career that I suddenly realized that at the leadership level, there really weren't many female, regardless of job discipline. And so, I, I was super passionate about user experience, always, always loved it. And then I started to look more broadly at the leadership and what was happening. And um, 
And I also have two daughters. And it was the realization of the importance of role models. We'd go see different movies. And one time we did, went to see the movie Madagascar, which, you know, which is a fun movie, lots of animals in it. It's, it's great fun. And when my husband asked my daughter um, who was her favorite character, she said, the hippopotamus. And it was like, we couldn't remember the hippopotamus. And the reason why she had said it was it was the only female character in the lineup. <laughs> and then that really was a, an eye-opener to the, the uh, influences for children. Is there's so much media that helps set, start to set the expectations. And the more you dig in, in, uh, in uh, America, in, Ho in Hollywood, when they make family films deliberately targeted at children, less than 20% of the speaking characters are women. A fraction of those women are represented as holding jobs. It is so not representative of the world that we live in, and yet it sets expectations of any of the women that are demonstrated as working, none of them, virtually none of them, come from a technology, uh, a science, technology, uh, math career background. You'll find them as nurses or teachers or supportive functions. And suddenly you realize that as they're growing up, their whole influence is not seeing women as leaders and as equals. And if, you know, I looked at my calendar, the year is 2015. It's desperately disappointing where everything is. So this isn't, so my, my agenda isn't just within design, it's within, um, within leadership at large. So when I moved on from Microsoft as, um, a few years ago, I actually now work uh, as a career coach and leadership training for women. A lot of the work I do is actually with women in user experience because that's the strength of my background as well. But it's really important that um, we start to help grow leadership. And the main reason like why businesses should care is because it means money for them. Uh, uh, as we've heard mentioned, like diversity leads to like more creative outcomes and diversity leads to more creative outcomes that have profit. It's, that is what will make a change happen. It's not just a social issue. It, you can have companies really focus on it. It's like it's an imperative. If they want to be successful, they actually do need to move to a more diverse workforce. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm highly supportive of. And change has to happen. And it's, I think it's awesome that this conference has chosen to have a women in design track really like it's super important um, because by calling it out it then I'm sure it helped the organization then really focus on trying to get more women as presenters at the event if you don't call it out it kind of just get you know it falls off the table but by calling it out it actually encourages us to take action on it so I think it's great that the, the conference has actually decided to embrace it this year. Hi, I'm Neha Modgil. I'm a co-founder of TechWave Consulting. And um, so I love the topic women in design. When uh, Babu introduced this topic to me last, some years ago, uh, my first thought was, that, you know, why women in design? Why not men in design? You know, why should women be segregated? Uh, and we had discussions around that. Um, and like Samir said, and I somewhere agree, that it's about celebration. It's about years of perhaps oppression, which is now turning around. So it's probably a celebration of that. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, I got a lovely WhatsApp message, which I thought a line of that I'm going to share. Uh, here, uh, it said that जिस घर की तख्ती पे मेरे नाम भी नहीं था, जिस घर की तख्ती पे मेरा नाम भी नहीं था, सारी उम्र उस घर को सजाने में गुजार दी। And that's the power of women. We don't even have a nameplate on the house, on the main door of the house, and we spend our lifetime decorating and looking after that house. And that selflessness, that concern. And that empathy is what makes women uh, not superior, but at least equivalent to men in this field of design is what I feel. In fact, if you go back and look at your households, 
you will see your mothers have been so concerned about you know what is the dish that you love what is the what is it that they should make for their husbands for their uh, father in laws for their mother in laws they will customize their behaviors according to everybody in the house and that's exactly what a ux designer needs to know and that's exactly how they need to behave right so culturally it's in our dna to be like that and hence i think women just become uh, better if i can say ux designers <laughs> and uh, in fact when i started this and i started employing you know when I, since i was a co-founder we were recruiting people we were growing our team um, somehow the recruitment just skewed towards having more women and then we you know got together and we decided we need men i mean there's no spice in the office with no men <laughs> so then we consciously started getting men in the office and um, i remember one of the discussions there are these two women uh, one man and me we sitting and discussing something and the discussion got very heated and this man used the word he shouldn't have used in front of women shouldn't have you know um, so and this girl said how can you say that in front of women he said oh i didn't realize i'm sitting with women and i thought that was wonderful i mean when we stop realizing we're sitting with men we're sitting with women is when we actually overcome the bias and that is what we should all aim towards you know not look at each other as a man or a woman but you know we together make things happen is how i look at it great so uh, going back to the point that we were discussing again yesterday i think this is something that um, uh, has to be a thought through from the grassroots level because there is something if you want to influence and shape women into leaders of the future there should be some influence and then we should be uh, having some conversations around what needs to be done is there anything that we could do to um, uh, influence or not necessarily improve uh, i'm not asking for like we need to change the education system and, and stuff but then to in, in inculcate these these values into uh, um, into education system so that um because ux india is a, a platform wherein we try to bring all three aspects of uh, of the industry like um, education and industry and also governance to some extent i would like to briefly touch upon all three aspects and bring women in design on par with what exactly we're doing right so uh, can you have a brief uh, perspective on what needs to be done uh, all the way from the grassroots level which is education and then how it can translate uh, through your career when we as design managers uh, recruit women designers and then how we can help them grow right so okay so um so what what we had been talking about um earlier was when you what, when you're in school we often see uh men and women are uh participate in design and in research classes and in all and in all lots of aspects of education and then the entry level positions is men and women are hired almost equally into those positions the challenges come as you start to move up in in role because that's often when um it's less about specific skills and measurable skills and it and being able to grow and move to the higher levels it's it becomes dependent on a slightly different set of skills and connections and one of the challenges and again it's i always thought it was just really interesting how um some of the challenges i saw for women are also the ones that user experience has had as well in terms of lack of sponsorship at the top lack of executive representation it's so much easier when the executive in a company it has had the job lower down in the company that you have because they really have so much sympathy and they know how to grow that individual and bring them on up in the company um and it said user experience has struggled with this and it's starting to change as in corporations you're starting to see executives at that level and that's also the challenge that women often face is having the somebody at a higher level in the company that can help bring along and and one be a role model so you can see it but also sponsorship for somebody that reaches down and um takes helps to train and pull a person further and forward in a company so but there's there's two parts there's one is how do how do we get become successful in the way the world is today and it takes a lot it does take effort and it takes investment of your own time to really take risks take chances to move on up 
And then it also requires people who are at the senior levels to really open their minds to embracing diversity. Um, when I became uh, a ma first time when I became a manager, the easiest uh, mistake to make as a manager when you f when you first go from an individual to becoming a, a manager is hiring more people like you, and it's really easy to do because you just want more of you to get more jobs done, to get more work done, and the best way to do that would be you know just to multiply yourself. And for me, I, ha I learned my lesson when I ended up uh, having mergers of teams, and so I ended up having more teams brought to me that I hadn't hired the individuals. And it was learning that there were really smart people coming from these other teams, but they weren't, they weren't like me. They were very, very different. And it was just realizing that I had to take time to appreciate the diversity of what they were bringing. And it took time and effort on my part as a manager to really do that. And again, I just happened to be a female manager, but it was diversity of work style that I was having to really make an effort to appreciate. And so that as people are moving into, actually, show of hands of how many of you managers right now? Okay, and keep those hands up. How many of you want to be a manager at some point in your career? All right, good. Okay, so it's you who, as you become managers, you're the ones that are going to be setting the expectations and uh, the rules for what comes. So really, really pay attention to diversity, whether it's gender or other aspects, is going to be super important. Cool. If I may, I'd like to share a personal story. Yeah, sure. So um, I had just had my daughter, and my husband and I were planning to have a second child. I think my daughter was about two. <coughs> and um, a really interesting project came my way, and I did have a sponsor, and they recommended, that, um, recommended me for the job. I knew at the back of my mind that we were trying to have a second child. And in all honesty, I went in to my manager, my sponsor, actually, and said, you know what, I, I, can't, I need to pull my hat out of the ring for this. Um, and they were really concerned, and they said, well, why? Can you tell me a little bit about why? And I said, well, you know, we're thinking about having a second baby, and I'm not sure that um, I'll be able to focus and give my best to this project, and so I'd like to throw my, uh, you know, pull my hat out of the ring. And this individual, and thank, you know, bless the soul, said some, asked, said, um, asked me this question. He said, are you already pregnant? I know I'm not supposed to be asking this, but are you already pregnant? And I said, no, we're thinking about it. And so he said, well, from everything I know, it takes about nine months to conceive. I mean, nine months to deliver <laughs> the baby. And there's going to take some time to conceive. So you're at least nine to 12 months away from going on maternity. So why are you pulling your hat out of the ring? And that just, you know, struck me and I was like, oh shit, yeah, you know, I'm planning something. I'm a very loyal um, employee. And I was thinking about the company and saying, gosh, you know, I want to stay here. I want to see the project and it's going to be at least a year. And, um, you know, this sponsor of mine said, do you think the men that have uh, thrown the hat in the ring are going to stay in this company for uh, nine to 12 months for sure. I said, I don't know. And he said, yeah, well, they don't know either, but they're not pulling their hat out of the ring. And so I, I share that story because um, I think a lot of us women, and when I've shared the story, a lot of folks have you know, related to it, and that's why I repeat it, to say that um, I'm so glad I had that sponsor because if I didn't have that wonderful job to come back to, I don't know if I would have come back to that job. Um, and, you know, it would have been just a boring job that I was doing that wasn't pushing me to my limits. So it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't really create that draw for me to come back. And um, if I had quit even before I had the opportunity, um, I'm just depriving myself of it. So I think the biggest thing that I share from this personal story is to be in the game and make it worthwhile. We're all making sacrifices, whether it's a woman or a man. But more so with women with children, there's a lot of guilt associated with, oh my god, my child is just three months old, I'm leaving my child behind. But what I say to other women is, make it worth it. Make that guilt worth it. The guilt's going to be there, it's not going to go away, it didn't go away for me, but make it worth it. If you're leaving a three-month-old child to do just a boring, monotonous job, 
um, it's not worth it, and I would have probably quit. But thank, thanks to the you know sponsor, I was raring to get back, and I got back in two months. I did have a lot of guilt associated with it, but you know what? I had the time of my life, and so I would say make it worth it. That's you know my biggest lesson that I'd like to share with other women as well. So Samir, uh, you run a design <coughs> company basically, right? So um, I'm pretty sure that you have a team that is a mix of both women and men and all that uh, evenly distributed. But can you uh, can you share uh, any success stories that involve women at any level of design life cycle uh, uh, that will help our audience? Uh, sure, there are actually right? plenty of those, and uh, you know. But we ask for a notice of one and a half years before you get pregnant. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the points I'd like to make is uh, what, what you said. You have to make it worth your while. Um, as managers and leaders in design, we understand that there are limitations just because of the gender. Yeah, I cannot be pregnant, right? No man can. Uh, not yet, at least. So we have to think about that and think about a long-term perspective in business. It's not just short-term, uh, three monthly cycles or a yearly appraisal cycle. If there's a value of a person, irrespective of man or woman, uh, especially for women, if, if you see the value in that person, you think about a long-term perspective, right? And then encourage that person to take leadership roles. So we have also said, you know, a lot of women say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a child and after that I'm taking a break of six months. I don't know, I'm completely out of date, how I'm going to do that. We encourage them, actually we also talk to their in-laws sometimes in saying that, you know, let her start working after, let's say, two or three months, whenever she's ready to do that. Um, and we've been having success stories like this, women leading from the front multiple projects, uh, and multiple teams, mm -hmm. in fact. Uh, and, and they've been very successful with the clients because one thing is for sure, they understand people a lot. Uh, you know, in the context of our culture especially, that they have to, you know, once a woman gets married, she goes to a different culture altogether, right? She still lives with her husband and in-laws, so she needs to understand the people out there, right? From day one. And that power of that woman kind of comes into the workplace as well, where she is dealing with customers on one hand, uh, her subordinates or teammates on one hand, and the managers and leaders on the other hand. So, and, and that's a natural thing. Why wouldn't you, you know, kind of uh, take advantage of that, right? And, and make her um, more capable and give them that freedom so that they can use that in the future. Thank you. So, Neha, you made an interesting statement, right? So, so yours was predominantly a women-dominated company, and then uh, to add some spice to it, you you had to kind of recruit men into it. So, how do you think it has changed the ecosystem, and then how is it working now? I mean, uh, do you have any success stories to share about men, women? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, when we started getting men in. Uh, we, were, we all worked in our own way, like we were women, we would have fun, we would hang around, we would party around, and we were really having a nice time doing what we were doing. When we started getting men in, we thought, you know, would they understand how we behave, how we work, and, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we wanted to get some people in. And it was interesting, in fact, <coughs> when I started TechWave about eight years ago, I was expecting my first baby, and uh, five years later, I gave birth to my second baby, and believe me, men have been so supportive. There have been times uh, when, in fact, I was working till one day before I delivered my second baby, and I had a, a meeting the next day, and this guy from my office called me. He said, I know that you've, you're in the hospital and you've just delivered. Don't worry, I'm gonna be taking care of all this. And he went, and he was just a fresher. I mean, one month is all that he'd worked for us. And he went, handled all the client meetings. So. I think it's not just women who support women. The world is completely changing. Men support women. They come out and show their support to women, which is wonderful. And um, in fact, we have women in our office who feel safer when they're out with men. You know, they feel it's all right if he drops me home. 
So um, I think the entire perspective is changing, but more importantly, it's how the top management is handling that perspective. You know, how is it from the top that it's trickling down to the bottom, which is very important. So like, uh, you know, she said, if you're at the top or if you're wanting to be at the top, ensure that you trickle that perspective down to the bottom because it's you who can get that change and it's your thought which will change the organization and the way it functions. So be empath, em, uh, you know, sensitive to women and their requirements. They do have certain different requirements. Uh, and if you've given them that kind of flexibility, you don't even know what wings you've given her to fly. So uh, trust her and let her be. So just quickly one uh, from the panel out here, right, because um, uh, if you have to think of one piece of advice for young women designers to succeed and excel in their career, what exactly is the one piece of advice that you can think of and then give to our audience is they can take away so that will set them up in line to succeed in their careers and then. So this, this is one piece that relates to something that has already been uh, said um, and that is uh, it, uh, to your example of the assumption that you've already planned so far ahead it's obviously not possible for you to take the job and anticipate it and you said that you were a year early I had somebody who worked for me who also came what asking about work-life balance if they had children and they they hadn't even met a partner at this point <laughs> so so this person was fabulous at planning ahead which is what I needed on the team right um, but it was like, you know, don't even worry about that. Well, that'll happen later, you know, we'll figure that out later. Um, but sort of one thing that advice for women and advice for leads and managers is if you are offered something and you, you want it, take it in the moment when it's offered to you the first time. Um, because so often women, when asked, and actually, we're stumbling a bit up here talking about who's sympathetic and empathetic to users, is the chances are that everybody in this room is more empathetic to users than perhaps some other job discipline types who are more mathematically based or something like that, because it's just maybe not where their natural skills lie, they lie somewhere else. So empathy is something that many, many people can have. When in psychology, they look at em empathy as identified as more of a feminine trait. But we all have a mixture. I can be uh, as aggressive uh, and argumentative in a meeting as a guy. You know, just put me in the right situation. That's considered more of a masculine trait. So we all have degrees uh, of, of this uh, experience. So, sorry, back to the advice. So one, if you are offered hey, you should go give a presentation. Oh, oh no, don't ask me, I'm not very good at presenting, I'll so and so, da da da. Often, women will, like, if you ask them three times, they'll finally say yes. They wanted to say yes the first time, but socially it was like, no, I won't do that. Or, you know, actually when I left my job as director of user research, I told, I was telling my team individually, I had uh, several managers who worked for me, the guys were like, oh, that's a shame you're leaving. Who's getting your job? <laughs> right? And the woman, when she came in, she was like, oh, no, you're leaving your job. What about my project? And what about this? And what about that? And, like, there was no immediacy in, like, uh, can I get your job? Um, so, one, if something's offered and you want it, take it. If you also want something, ask for it. You know, what can the, the best that can happen, or the worst thing that can happen is that somebody will say no. So, okay, now advice for leaders and managers. If you are offering something to someone who could be more empathetic to users, more shy, might be female, and they say, oh, I don't think so, ask them again, and then ask them again. <laughs> really double check, because it, it, it's top down, bottom up, and I said we really need the diversity period, right? So it's on both fronts to try and make this happen. So that's just sort of one piece of advice. Um, <laughs> well, outside of um, make it worth it, I would say the second thing would be um, stay persistent and look for sponsors. Um, I find that, you know, we've talked about as you uh, progress your career, the diversity, the gender diversity thins out. 
And I think it's really important to get the support, like um, you were talking about, Neha, with, um, with the men around you, the, the other folks around you. We were had, uh, again, a quick personal story. Um, we were talking about diversity of all topics, and I was the only woman in the room with um, you know, about 10 to 15 men. And I noticed something that I mentioned, and right away, as soon as I said it, I got literally pounced on. And I said, okay, you know what, I'm just gonna let it go. But later, I found two of the folks that were in the meeting and said, hey, you know what, if this environment is really going to be an inclusive environment, even if my idea is like the stupidest idea or my thoughts the stupidest, at least it needs to be voiced and understood and reciprocated, like, you know, at least noted down. Um, and so after that, though, as soon as I said that, I found that every time we were in a meeting, and there was a minority voice, they were helping represent it. They didn't necessarily agree with me, and that wasn't what I was asking for, but just the voice to be heard. So I would say um, get sponsors, get people that can support you around you, that just, um, you know, if you're in an environment where, you know, you, you're not uh, quite the minority as a gender, it just helps multiply your voice. And remember that you're being hired for that diverse perspective. So in my opinion, I wasn't doing my job if my perspective wasn't being heard. So it wasn't about me, but it was about doing a great job and the outcome for the company itself. Um, and that really helps. So that's, that's what I would pass on to everyone. Cool. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to have one last question for, for the panel out here. Maybe we can start with this, Samir. Um, so what do you think UX India should be focusing on going forward uh, with, with this kind of program? Because uh, this year we have launched this program to celebrate 10 years of UX and also celebrate the spirit of women in design. But um, as someone who is from the industry and as someone who, is, who has been working with women, right? And, and, you know, what do you think we should focus on year after year going forward um, as a part of this program? For this particular topic? For this particular segment, yeah. So, so I think, you know, you know, we've talked about, you know, different aspects of uh, the opportunities that women get or don't get and the diversity. Um, I, I think we should encourage um, wherever it is possible uh, to give opportunities to, you know, different women of all, you know, maybe managers, yep. maybe there are teams to kind of showcase, uh, you know, their expertise and knowledge in this particular forum, which would kind of then, um, you know, make sure that the larger culture of design is influenced by uh, that particular initiative, uh, which will also make sure in a way uh, that um, women take that challenge. So right. women get inspired by women. Sure. That's, that's what is required. We see a lot of this happening in, uh, you know, larger industries like uh, Kiran Majumdar Shah yeah. or, you know, Indra Nui or others. Mm -hmm. But in the design industry, I don't think there are enough women mm -hmm. to inspire other women and other men as well. Yeah. So that's what we need, I think. Any thoughts, Neha? Yeah, I agree with Samir because, you know, yesterday I, uh, I'm talking at a women in design panel uh, post lunch. I had two uh, ladies who came to me and said, you know, we want to hear you because we want to get inspired. We want to know how you achieved it and what is the path to success. So um, I think there are a lot of women there. In fact, even when we hire, we hear women after two months, they say we want to leave because my parents don't want me to work. My husband has a problem. We need to counsel them. We need to tell them that, you know, go back. This is exactly, we give them a script. This is exactly what you need to tell them. And then they come back and they say, oh, it worked. So uh, it's, it's important to be able to inspire. Maybe all of us here are lucky. We've had supportive parents, supportive in-laws, supportive families. So uh, we need to be able to reach out to more women and tell them, you know, even if they're not supportive, this is how you get that support. So to be able to share these things is, I think, what we can contribute. And if we can have more of such discussions and reach out to not just women in UX design, but there are so many other design fields where women are excelling. There's fashion design, there's product design. If we can get all of them together, hear about how they made it happen, it'll just be such a wonderful forum. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that one of my assumptions that I had when I started with this uh, session today was empathy is just a trait of women. but. It, it, it's not 
so uh, we are all designers. I think we all need, need to be empathetic towards our uh, customers, users that we talk to. So I think that's, that's been a great of inaugural Women in Design session. Um, I, I thank the audience in the first place for being so patient and then listening to your panelists. And thank you, uh, thank you for uh, our, our great panelists to be here on stage today.